William Blackford lived out his long post-war life in Virginia and Louisiana until 1905, a mixture of joy and trials. He was always defined, however, as a young cavalryman and close confidant of General Jeb Stuart of the 1st Virginia Cavalry. Time and time again he was spirited out of harm's way in tight Civil War clashes by his closest friend and ally, his dark mahogany bay and very remarkable horse named Comet. First spotted by Blackford in the stables of his father-in-law near Abingdon, Virginia in 1861. Jeb Stewart would later say that Comet was a perfect model of a war horse. Comet too survived the war and gratefully lived out his days in the peaceful fields of his comrade, the closest of friends to the end. In late August 1862, after the Second Battle of Manassas Bull Run, Federal General Pope's forces were moving down the pike toward Centerville, Virginia, with Confederate General Lee and Stuart's cavalry following. Blackford with Stuart wrote, At Fairfax Courthouse, the Federals made a show of throwing up entrenchment and offering battle. Afterwards, our advance guard of cavalry drove it back in some confusion. And we encamped for the night at Chantilly. Comet had cast a shoe that day, and on September 1st it was absolutely necessary to have one of those I always carried in my saddle pockets put on at once. The forges of the infantry's artillery were on the march near us, and more convenient than the cavalry forges. So I got leave of absence, and got the blacksmith of one of them a round fee to do the work at the first halt the column made. I had to follow along the road for this purpose for some time. Then came my time and after submitting to another levy of a fee from the blacksmith on the ground that we were just going to have a fight and that the shoe a horse in action with cannonballs flying was worth something extra. He at last lit his fire and Put on the shoe. It was with inexpressible joy that I once more felt my noble horse tread freely and without a limp as I mounted to see what was going on and why the halt was made. I saw at once the unmistakable evidence of the near approach of the enemy. The Confederate men were in line of battle along the road, crouching down behind the sheltering bank at its side, with the quiet intensity of expression on their faces that to the experienced eye betokened an approaching storm.
which soon cast its preliminary drops in the form of shells whizzing by and bursting beyond. Blackford on Comet ascended the rest of a hill just vacated by General Lee. Shells were coming from a battery on a hill about a thousand yards distant. Soldiers were sheltering behind the banks of a road cut near, below, and in front of Blackford and Comet. Blackford wrote, While sitting on my horse, scanning the scene, a shell passed through the crest of the bank and exploded right among the men before me. I was covered with the sand and earth it threw up and was contemplating the destruction it had produced, the largest I have ever seen from one shell, with no little satisfaction at having escaped. For a dozen men were lying, writhing, and jumping about at my feet. I felt myself slowly sinking and my feet almost touching the ground. <laughs> Comet had been struck in the neck and from the wound the blood spouted several feet in a stream as large as my finger. To spring to the ground, unbuckle the girths, and strip off the saddle was the work of an instant, for I knew it was very difficult to get a saddle off a dead horse. The cool rain upon his back revived him, and he stood up, turning his head and looking me full in the face with his large, beautiful eyes, as plainly beseeching assistance as if he had expressed himself in words. I could not keep the tears and large drops from trickling down my cheeks, and from his eyes the tears and large drops fell on the agony he suffered as he gazed wistfully at me. I screwed my handkerchief into the wound and stopped the flow of blood. In a few moments, the nervous shock was passed and I had hoped for recovery. The poor fellows had fallen were quickly taken off and the gap in the ranks closed up. Several of the men came around to offer me assistance and showed more sympathy for the horse than they had done for all their fallen comrades. Such is the soldier. For a man to be killed is a matter of course. If not his comrade, it might have been himself. But to see a beautiful horse bleeding and suffering so calmly is quite another thing. And they wept. After about an hour or two, I found that the handkerchief could be withdrawn from Comet's wound. His appetite was good. It was necessary for his food to be up on a level with his head, for the neck soon swelled up to such an extent that it was impossible for him to reach the ground. I employed a man in the battery to lead Comet and attend to feeding him until I could find some farmer who would undertake to nurse him until we got back from Maryland, where it was evident we were now going. Before reaching the Potomac, I was fortunate enough to find a farmer who was willing to take Comet and was particularly well situated for keeping him. He had a meadow next to the barn in which stood stacks of hay from which Comet could eat and an elevated trough from which he could drink without putting his head down 
and here I arranged for him to stay. After our return from the Maryland campaign, while at the Bower in the Valley, I came over and got him. The farm was then within the lines of the enemy, but getting an escort of three men, I went in at night and took him from the immediate neighborhood of their camps. The farmers had said that several times parties had examined the horse, but thought him not worth taking in his condition. I sent Comet home, and the wound continued to run so as to render him useless for the rest of the war.